consider this a small oasis of Egyptian culture for the next hour and a half. Uh, our distinguished guest lecturer, who I think most of you have met, is Hishan Mediore. And um, he is a native of contemporary Cairo, but uh, is really fascinated and studied a lot about ancient Egypt, which is a real love of his. Um, and knows about many aspects, um, art, architecture, temples, tombs, customs of both everyday life and the afterlife. And, um, ancient Egyptian religion. He studied at the University of Cairo and is employed as a lecturer on guide um, in Egypt and uh, as a lecturer in England. Uh, Nancy Hoffman and I were, um, had a trip to Egypt in January of this year and we were lucky enough to have Hisham as our guide and Hisham uh, was not only good at imparting information and educating us about things, but he can really put things in context. So, <clears throat> you know, the sights and sound of Egypt are, are just sort of overwhelming. And he was able to make things more coherent. And he was a great guy, so we thought he should come to Jackson. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, I uh, met most of you actually before, and uh, Amy introduced myself to you. So I hope that within the coming uh, hour, uh, I will cover some of the uh, main points about certain subjects concerning ancient Egypt. Uh, we've discussed before art in ancient Egypt and um, the evolution of construction. We talk today about festivals in Egypt. And I say festivals in Egypt, not in ancient Egypt. Because we are talking today about the festivals we are running nowadays in the modern time in Egypt and how we are relating them back to the festivals in ancient Egypt. To be just an amazing fact about this country, that traditions are much stronger than religion. Uh, Egypt is classified now as an Islamic country. It's like 93% are practicing Islam, which is the Sunni sect. And I guess that in America now you get to hear about Sunni and Shia. Um, uh, Egypt is a Sunni country. Um, country like Iraq is a Shia country mainly. So. Uh, the Middle East, there are some countries uh, which are Sunni and uh, 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 or Shia, and some are half and half. But uh, Egypt is mainly an Islamic Sunni, 93% of the population, and about uh, 7 to 8% uh, Christian, uh, what we know, what, what are known as Copts. We'll talk about Coptic uh, religion tomorrow in the church and that will be a detailed idea about Christianity in Egypt. But we have to go back into history and uh, uh, understand that uh, the nature of Egypt made the Egyptians quite religious. They were very uh, sticking to their land and to their religion and to their belief. So they worshipped more than 2,000 gods and goddesses. But all the way through, although they had that large number of gods being worshipped in Egypt, they believed in only one main god, regardless his name. Some of the names are very famous, like Ra or Amun-Ra, and some are less famous, like Khiburu or Atom. They are all names of the main god of Egypt, who was the sun god. In a country like Egypt, you cannot ignore the sun. You get up early with the sunrise, then you do anything between sunrise and sunset. Sunset, it gets dark, so you go home, get ready to sleep. When you are asleep, it's like a rehearsal for what might happen to them when they die. 
So sleeping is like being half dead. Then the following morning they wake up from their sleep and then they start acting again. It's exactly like the sun god or the solar disk which is traveling in the sky for the 12 hours of the day and then it sets behind the mountains of the West Bank and then born again the following morning. So regardless the name of the god, but let's talk about him as Amun-Ra. And this is a picture of Amun-Ra here. Amun-Ra had more than one form, animal forms, human forms. And uh, this one is one of the main forms of Amun-Ra. Uh, as you can see, is a human figure and uh, uh, the, the falcon head with the solar disk on the top of his head. So that was the most common figure of the sun god. We had some other figures of Amun-Ra in the form of a man and the face of a man also, but wearing a crown with the two long feathers. But this one is even more common to describe Amun-Ra. The other gods, the rest of the 2000 gods in Egypt, they were like secondary gods. So each one of them was either a local god for a certain area or he was a god for a certain thing like we had a god of creation the one who's modeling humans and making them out of clay and give them life uh, the goddess of war the goddess of love and beauty the god of the hereafter the god of mummification so each one of the gods was in charge of a certain mission so it's very much like when we think about it today it's very much like angels like different angels and everyone is performing certain thing and then reporting at the end to god or to the main god so the god of creation is reporting to amun ra uh, the goddess of beauty is reporting to amun ra so they all work under the umbrella of amun ra or the sun god later in history Christianity was introduced, but before Christianity, Judaism was introduced as well, as we know that Joseph, the man of the coat of many colors, and the Israelites had certain time in Egypt before the Exodus. So definitely they left an influence on the way people were, were worshipping in ancient Egypt. Haven't changed the religion, but definitely put sort of an influence on the belief in Egypt. Later on, Christianity was introduced, officially was introduced by St. Mark in the year 61 AD. And it was very similar to some of the beliefs, as we'll talk to more about Christianity. But definitely, Christianity put a stronger influence on uh, the society in Egypt. But I would say that Christianity melted in, in the society and the belief of ancient Egypt. Then 600 years later, Islam was introduced in the year 641 AD. The Arabs coming from Saudi Arabia introducing Islam as a religion and Arabic as a language. It took about four centuries from the 7th century AD to the 11th century AD to change the majority in Egypt to become Muslims. So not immediately at once, it took like four centuries for the society in Egypt to change gradually from a Christian society to a Muslim society. From using Coptic language to use Arabic as a main language. So Arabic was never the main language in Egypt until the 11th century AD. Before that it was the Coptic language which is the latest version of the ancient Egyptian language. The, the, the people in Egypt realized that it was a great motive for them to learn Arabic when they are converting to Islam because when you learn Arabic they can read the Quran which is in, in Arabic so they can have a better understanding of the Quran so they, they could choose between learning the Coptic language which is a difficult language and Arabic, or Arabic, and also Arabic is another different, uh, difficult language, but definitely they chose Arabic because at least it gave them the chance to read the Quran and to understand their religion. 
the Egyptians in general are quite religious. So Christians are quite religion, religious and Muslims are quite religious. The way of practicing religion in Egypt is very different. Although Egypt is an Islamic country located in the heart of the Middle East, the way people practice Islam as a religion is very different from the rest of the Islamic world. Again, for Christianity, they created their own sect, which is the Coptic sect. And you only find Coptic sect in Egypt. It was created in Egypt and remained in Egypt. The identity of the Egyptian church, which was one of the main churches at the beginning of Christianity, was the Church of Alexandria and created its own identity and introduced lots of things to the, the religion Christianity. Uh, so even until now, we find people are sticking to the religion. You find most of the Egyptians are practicing. They go to the church, they go to the mosque, and even if they don't go every day, they go at least once a week. Uh, the special events, the special uh, uh, religious uh, uh, celebration, uh, it's very important issue uh, for the Egyptians, either Muslims or uh, Christians. Also, religion is that strong, either Islam or Christianity, we can still sense and feel the influence of the ancient Egyptian beliefs in the way people are practicing religion nowadays. So, I'll give you a couple of examples. This is like example of some of the carvings in, in the temples. This is the temple of Komombo, which is in Upper Egypt. And uh, you can see this lady here was goddess Isis. Isis in the human form. And she's wearing the tools of a cow flanking the solar disk. This god was the god Betah, and god Betah was the god of the city of Memphis, the god of the city of Memphis, who is a local god, and he was considered also as the god of medicine earlier on, before they changed the god of medicine later on to be Imhotep. In the temple of Luxor, which is in the heart of the city of Luxor, the temple of Luxor is was and still one of the most famous and one of the main temples in Egypt. The Temple of Luxor was part of a great complex, which is the complex of Karnak. So the Temples of Luxor and Karnak are dated back to almost 2000 BC, so like 4000 years old. And when they build the two temples, Karnak is the main one, massive building, and Luxor is smaller as part of the complex was connected to or linked to Karnak through an avenue of Sphinx. So here this carving on the walls of the temple of Luxor, we have the main entrance. The pylon is carved and the statues, the two seated closer statues of Ramesses II and the four standing ones. That's the main entrance like described or carved on the walls of the Temple of Luxor. The story of the Temple of Luxor, that it was dedicated to Goddess Mut. And Goddess Mut was the wife of Amun-Ra. The temples of Karnak were dedicated to Amun-Ra. Okay, so the husband lives in one temple and the wife lives in the other temple. The distance between the two of them is two miles, which is the length of the avenue of the Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> to be safe. <laughs> so, once a year, the, the husband used to visit the wife. Only once a year. Which is a big festival, we call it the Opet Festival. The Opet Festival takes place during the second half of July. 17th to the 19th of July, which is the time when the Nile start, starts rising and the beginning of the great inundation uh, of the River Nile, which is like a very good sign that they will have lots of water and then they will have uh, uh, plenty of uh, chances to grow crops. and So it's like a, a very good sign. So in, in that day, 
the priests of Amun-Ra from Karnak, they take the statue, each temple. In the sanctuary, they used to have a statue, maybe this size, not a big statue. Not like those big statues we see them outside the temples and so on. Just a very little statue, and it's not a heavy one. So it could be easily carried by one or two. So it's a wooden statue, well ornamented with gold and silver, precious stones and so on. They put it inside a little wooden shrine. They hide the statue completely, they carry the, the, the shrine on their shoulders and they travel down from Karnak to Luxor to visit his wife. Then they put the statue of the gods, Amun-Ra, next to the statue of his wife, Mut, for ten nights. Yeah. Those ten nights known as the good reunion of the two gods. Okay, the open festival was the good reunion of the two gods. The 11th day in the morning, they take the statue and put it again in the same shrine and they travel back to uh, uh, Karnak. That's the end of the festival, right? Nobody, none of the locals was allowed to see the statue. So the statue must be hidden. What about the priests? Ah, the priests were carrying the shrine on their shoulders, but they never see the statue as well. The only people who are allowed to see and touch the statue were the king or and the high priest. Only the two of them. And then they put the statue in the shrine, called the priest to come and carry it on the shoulders. Right? This is very important to know about ancient Egypt. But the elite of the society were allowed to attend part of this festival. They come in part of the temple and it's the open court and they cannot go further uh, than that, right? So the inner section is mainly for religious reasons and the one who's taking care of it was the king and the high priest. Here we have a picture of the procession. So we can see the king in the front. That king, by the way, was Ramesses II. And you can see the priests in their uh, uniform in their uniform and the uniform is like sort of a white gown and uh, 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 sometimes for for a high level of priests they have like an animal skin uh, uh, covering also part of their body that's like a typical uniform of the priests that's the wooden shrine looks like a bark and it is decorated from the front and the back with the head of the god Amun-Ra. The head of the god Amun-Ra here was the ram head. Yeah, He was a ram-headed god. So in Luxor, we find them taking this form, a, a, a human uh, body and a, a ram head. That's the shrine where they put the statue of Amun-Ra inside. Okay, So that's documented on the walls of the temple of Luxor. Here, another picture showing the king and he was burning incense and making offerings to the god Amun-Ra and the god Amun-Men. The god Amun-Men is very similar to Amun-Ra, but he was the god of fertility as you can see his manhood here and he's wearing the two long feathers I told you about. This is another form of the god Amun-Ra. So that's part of the festival during the procession. Uh, here we have a picture showing that, that, that they were celebrating this festival also uh, um, when the Nile rises and uh, the, the, the amount of water increases, which is indication of fertility. Uh, they were taking boats and they were going into the marshes and they were doing sort of hunting and, and fishing and so on. So they are using like little sticks and we found the original sticks like those, which are displayed now in the Egyptian Museum among the collection of King Tutankhamun. They are very much like the famous boomerangs. And that was used in ancient Egypt thousands of years, I think, before using them in Australia. Uh, that's 
a later stage of the procession. We are getting closer now to the temple of Luxor and before you can see the walls of the temple here. So it's like the end of their journey coming from Karnak and they are it's it's badly ruined and badly damaged you can imagine because this temple of Luxor is only a few yards far from the river Nile so over the years uh, was silting up and uh, uh, the, the damage caused especially over the last 40 years because of building the high dam and the high dam building up the water behind in the lake Nasser building up the silt as well and uh, that causing like short of uh, silt uh, uh, shortage of uh, silt uh, in in the soil uh, in the Nile Valley and it's affecting the monuments by increasing, increasing the salinity of the soil. Inside the Temple of Luxor, we find something amazing, very strange. This is a mosque. That's the ground level. This is where we walk when we get into the Temple of Luxor. So above our heads, there is a mosque built much higher than the temple. The mosque is known as the mosque of Abu al-Hajjaj. Who was this guy? This guy was a Moroccan and he was traveling through Africa to go to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca for pilgrimage. And that was the route they take when they come from Morocco, Tunisia and Algeria. They come this way into Egypt and they go south to near Luxor from Luxor, they cross the Eastern Desert so they can take boats from there across the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. That was the most common route for pilgrimage uh, about uh, 1,000 years ago. So Abu al-Hajjaj came from Morocco, stopped in Luxor for a while, like the city, like many other travelers, and decided to come back after pilgrimage to settle down in Luxor. So when he came back from Saudi Arabia and settled down in Luxor, he decided to build a mosque. So that was the location of the mosque. Why he built it on the top of the temple? Because then was nothing like a temple. It was almost buried in silt. So that was the ground level. As you can see the door, that's the door here. Yeah? So that was the ground level up to here. When Abu al-Hajjaj was in Luxor like 1,000 years ago and built the mosque on the top of the temple of Luxor. Okay? Right. Abu al-Hajjaj is a Sunni. And according to the Sunni sect, we don't believe in priesthood. We don't need a priest to link us to God. We don't need an Imam. Not like the Shia. So you want to pray to God? do it you want to talk to god just go and pray you want to to let god talk to you just read the quran so there is no link i mean you don't need anybody to link you to god god is always there when you need them so in, you don't need any mediator between you and god that's why it is forbidden to look at anyone highly like an imam or or take his word like the word of god because you have already the word of god in the quran and for burial as well it should be uh, not marked we shouldn't have the tombs with tombstones or anything like this according to the islamic uh, rituals and beliefs but because we have a very heavy strong influence from ancient egypt so we find that the way they have their tombs and their burial in Egypt is very much similar to the tombs in ancient Egypt. So we have like a tomb built above ground like a mastaba and underground are the chambers where they have the uh, bodies buried. Okay, so anyway, Abu Hajjaj was a good guy. Okay, good for him. But the location of the temple on the top of uh, the, the mosque on the top of the temple actually led to a fascinating fact that until today they celebrate what is called Al Mulid. What is Al Mulid? If we translate it, it will be the birthday of Abu al Hajjaj. They ce celebrate the birthday of Abu al Hajjaj, which is completely against religion, against Islam as a religion. Yeah, because you are just 
memorizing this person and he shouldn't I mean you should think of God don't think of anyone else so the word al mulid is used not just for the birthday of Abu Hajjaj but also for all the birthdays of all the famous religious leaders lived long time ago yeah not just this one during that festival the birthday of Abu Hajjaj this is like modern pictures and these are the outer walls of the mosque from the street so you can look at the crowd and here you will notice something funny look at those little shrines those in green cloth yeah these shrines during the birthday of Abu Hajjaj or Mulit the locals get a wooden shrine empty nothing inside and they cover it with green cloth and then they carry it and transport it all around the city of Luxor more or less like the route they used to do or used to take when they were traveling with the statue of Amun Ra from Karnak to Luxor I bet that the locals do this without knowing that their great ancestors used to do the same thing thousands of years ago so they, they just kept doing the same thing without noticing that this is like ancient Egyptian belief. They don't believe in, in Amun Ra. They believe in Islam. But they still carry on sort of processions. They never stop. They still carry it. And that's a very good example. I just chose a couple of examples to, to give an idea about how uh, 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 civilization is very deep uh, 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 with its roots into uh, Egypt. Uh, here you can see also other pictures and, and it tells you actually, I mean, for those being to Egypt, maybe you notice that this is not the common colorful dresses that people wear, but it's very colorful as you can see. And uh, especially for the children, they, they wear, it's like Christmas, like uh, uh, Easter, like very special occasions. Uh, the people go out and enjoy themselves in the gardens and, and so on and join this sort of procession and, and they follow the shrine and, and uh, uh, enjoy their day out. So here is a closer uh, picture uh, that's about like 40 years old and uh, the shrine is carried on a camel. Uh, they don't do it anymore because of the traffic and the city is really busy and they cannot actually have this on camels or stuff but they have it on, on, on a car now yeah? so but this is like 40 years old and it looks like from uh, the dresses they are wearing as well uh, here we get back to uh, the, the procession and shrine so you see the similarity that's ancient Egypt and that's modern Egypt now another big festival in Egypt is called Shem El Nasim. Shem El Nasim means the fresh air. Or if we translate it exactly in words, so it will be to smell the fresh air. Shem El Nasim. Okay. Shem El Nasim is always the first Monday after Easter. Okay. It's not a, a Christian festival. It's a typical Egyptian festival. Thousands of years before Christianity. Now, they celebrate it all over Egypt. Muslims and Christians, they stick to Sham and Nasim or smelling the fresh air. Egypt also, it is mainly a desert. It has been always famous for agriculture counting on the Nile Valley and the Delta. And the main source of water has been always the River Nile. They divided the season into, uh, sorry, the, the year into three seasons. The last season was harvest, which is spring. And the end of the year will be July. And then a new year will start with the great Nile inundation. So harvest means collecting the crops which means they will have enough food to eat and they will have enough food to store for the winter and so on when they don't have harvest. They used to have only one crop a year because it was one once irrigation 
a year which is in July, July and August. So this is a picture showing uh, also going into the garden in ancient Egypt and uh, we've seen this before but this is a clearer one. And uh, in those days of Sham and Nisim and Abu al-Hajjaj, they have some special kind of dance and uh, uh, sort of a folklore uh, dance to enjoy. Uh, one of these uh, kind of theme dance uh, is stick dance that men carry long sticks and, and you see them in Egypt all the time uh, men are carrying a very long stick very much like in ancient Egypt uh, when the high priest was carrying a very long stick so they, 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 um, they dance together as if they are fighting you know that the, 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 um, the street fight or uh, uh, street dance or something like this as if they are fighting, they are not fighting, they are just performing their play with the stick, which is very clever. Actually, we have another picture here. That's from uh, one of the folklore shows. Now it's becoming like part of the folklore shows of Egypt. So this is on one of the famous stages in Cairo. And he's dressing up in Galabea, which is uh, the uh, traditional costume in Egypt. Uh, maybe you've heard about something called the, the whirling dervish yeah, or what we call tanura. So the whirling dervish actually is another religious dance. So it goes back to the very early time of Islam. Um, when a, a group of people came and conquered Egypt from Morocco, they were Shia. They put influence of Shia uh, belief on, on the Egyptian society. It didn't last for long. But some of their influence remained in Egypt, like this sort of dance. It's kind of meditation. The dancer, they wear that beautiful costume with like two long skirts on top of each other's. And then they start going around. You can see the skirts. This is the one of them. That's the top one. And that's the bottom one or the lower one. And they keep going around non-stop for half an hour, for an hour. Say whatever you like. Non-stop. They never get dizzy because they are meditating. They, they don't see anybody around them. They are just meditating. They are flying with God. So they're flying in the sky and uh, uh, th th this is kind of a Sufi or a Shia uh, way of practicing which is again not uh, Sunni like uh, majority of the Egyptians but you find it still in Egypt because it goes back to the root of uh, Islam uh, about 1000 years ago. So that's another picture of the Tanura before he takes off the uh, uh, the first skirt and still at the beginning of the dance it's it's magnificent and actually they use it for telling stories sometimes they they are acting to tell you a story while they are dancing and mainly it's the story of life and death so it tells you about the birth of a child and then uh, going around like you know suffering during your life and so on and so and the rebirth so it's really something uh, very special about Egypt. Uh, in some of the tombs in Luxor, we found pictures and scenes telling us about the daily life. So this scene in particular of some of the ladies sitting on the floor uh, and they, they, they have their hands, uh, they grab the clay or uh, uh, the, the, the sand and the mud and they cover their hair and face. Why are they doing so? Because they and can see their tears as well. Because they are mourners. They, they lost someone dear in their family. So this is the way to express their sadness. Yeah? And they were grieving. And they were sitting outside the house or sitting outside the tomb or some of them sitting outside the house and some of them sitting outside the tomb 
when Islam was introduced, that was completely forbidden. Completely. You are allowed to be sad. You are allowed to cry. You are allowed to show your sadness in a way or another. But you have to put in consideration that this is the will of God. Your time is up, is up. You can be sad, but you don't have to exaggerate this. And Prophet Muhammad of Islam gave us a very good example. He lost three of his sons. So after the death of one of his sons, it happened that was an eclipse of the sun. So his followers said, ah, the sun is angry or the sun is sad for your great loss. He said, no, this is the will of God. I could be sad. I can cry him, yes. But nothing like sunrise or sunset or moon or whatever like this will interfere because this is the will of God. He was teaching us not to put an eye on any miracles because it's all about mental belief. So it is completely forbidden to uh, torn your dress or to shave your hair or to do any sort of exaggeration to show your sadness. You can be sad, yes, but you have to respect the will of God. And by the way, when we look at most of women in Egypt, we find them wearing black dresses. Like here. I will, I will get back to this one, but the most common color for the ladies' dresses is black. And people are confused because they see ladies in in uh, Saudi Arabia they wear black as well so you think that maybe this is because of Islam no matter of fact the color of the dress in Egypt is very different because Egypt is different I wouldn't say better or worse but Egypt is different from the rest of the world the rest of the Arab countries the rest of the Islamic world and the significance of the black dress has nothing to do with religion it goes back to the time of ancient Egypt. The ladies used to wear, when they lose someone in their family, they wear white dresses, as you can see, almost transparent, and uh, uh, they also half naked. Yeah, They are like topless. This is from uh, one of the tombs in Luxor. Uh, called Ramosa, one of the most beautiful tombs actually in Luxor. Uh, so that was the common color. They wear that dress, the ladies wear that dress for 40 days. 40 days. Why 40 days? Because when someone is dead, they used to have mummification, and the mummification lasts for 72 days. So the first stage of mummification is to make the body dry and so it takes 40 days. So they wear that dress for the 40 days, the first stage of mummification. And then after that they can carry on wearing it if they want or they give it up. Yeah, and they wear something else. When the Greeks came to Egypt, 300 BC, they said, okay, that's good. We keep wearing that dress for 40 days, no problem, we follow the Egyptians, but we, we don't find the white color is good for funeral and mourners and so on. So they changed the color from white to black. So since the time of the Greeks, when someone is dead in the family or in the village, the females wear black for at least 40 days. Now because we are you know, uh, practicing sort of strong family ties, so we find that if someone uh, 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 lost someone dear in, in the family and even in the village so they wear black for even longer than 40 days so it tend to be like sort of traditional that the ladies wear black for most of the time because definitely will be someone dead in the village today or tomorrow you know what I mean so it's not just the family it's becoming the whole society yeah so as if you are sharing uh, the grief and the sadness of your friend or your neighbor you know what I mean? So it's not just your own family, it's the whole village uh, sharing this thing. So you find here funeral. Um, you can see the, 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 the sad ladies here and um, they are 
uh, doing very much like uh, the ladies in ancient Egypt, which is against religion, but matter of fact, they don't know this. They don't know that they are making a big mistake doing that. And the mistake, it's not only uh, 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 back uh, on them, it's all also on the deceased. So they are, they are harming him, they are hurting him by doing so. So it is strictly forbidden to do any of this sort of uh, exaggerated acts during the funeral because it must be like sort of a respect to the, the God and to the will of God. Uh, that might be a funny session. <laughs> Uh, it's a circumcision and uh, maybe you know this that in Islam we, we, we have circumcision and also in Judaism uh, but actually it goes back to much earlier time before Moses and before Islam so this is one of uh, uh, the scenes of circumcisions for men in ancient Egypt you can see uh, uh, like a, a, a graph of it and uh, it kept on and on by the time of Judaism and then was also uh, carried on by the time of Islam. So until now we have circumcision for men, not for women, for men. Some of the people in the villages, they have circumcision for women and the government is fighting this severely, severely, because it caused lots of problems. I would say that the modern generations, they don't do it. I would say starting from the generation of my mother, in the cities, they stopped doing it. But in the villages, they kept doing it and it causes lots of damage to uh, uh, the female and also to the marriage later on in the future. So now they are learning. The education is helping a lot to understand this. But for, for male, it's, it's like a must and they do it. And also the Christians in Egypt, the Copts, they have circumcision for men. So again, it has nothing to do with religion. It's mainly traditions. So that's a long, long time before Islam or Christianity or Judaism. We back to Shemini Sin. This is what I told you about, about uh, fresh air. Uh, it's really funny because the way we celebrate that Shemini Sin, which is usually in April, uh, it's very much like in ancient Egypt. They, they, they used to have eggs and they used to have uh, uh, fish. And well, actually, they, they eat the fish that day in a very special way. One of the ways for preserving uh, fish to be stored for a long time in, in such a hot country is by putting it in huge amount of salt. So it's a salty fish. Uh, maybe you can call it because it smells really bad, like a rotten fish, uh, this one here. And uh, we get serious problems now with people eating it uh, in that day because sometimes it's not very hygienic and sometimes the body cannot actually absorb this. We are not equipped for it. They used to be, yes, thousands of years ago, but we were not, so it's not really healthy. And it's, it's really delicious and, and attractive. So. The, the, the minute you start eating it, you never stop eating it. <laughs> so so it, it, it's really, really good thing to eat. But it's, it's very good because it gives like um, uh, the, the feeling of the, or the spirit of the festival. Uh, they, they paint on, on eggs and uh, maybe you think that this is something new, but actually it goes back to ancient Egypt. So even the colored eggs is back to ancient Egypt. Well, these guys have done everything, you know. <laughs> They've introduced everything to us. So painting the eggs, we carried on doing the same thing, and we, we do the same thing going out to the gardens, every single one. If you go now to Egypt, during that day, you cannot believe it. If, if it happens that you are in Cairo or in Luxor or any of the cities along the River Nile, you cannot imagine the amount of people on, in the gardens and, and along the Nile and on boats and, and rowing down, down the Nile or sailboats, falukas or whatever and lots of um, uh, dancing shows and, and it's amazing. So here is a picture also showing this festival which is again 
the celebration of harvest, which means uh, lots of wealth to them. Uh, that will be our last slide because I'm not going to talk about this particular issue because it might take us until tomorrow uh, when we talk about the Exodus. Uh, this is a very strange uh, figure of someone holding a rope which looks like a snake. Can you see it? Okay. Uh, the story of the Exodus and uh, Moses and the Pharaoh um, when they, they had sort of a challenge. Um, that challenge day was Shem Minisim. That uh, Carnival day when everybody was gathered from everywhere. So the Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, wanted to show off yeah, in front of everyone, in front of that big crowd, and he was quite sure that his uh, priests or the magicians would defeat Moses. So the, the, the story about that challenge, that uh, Moses had his stick, that magic stick, and uh, uh, he met the Pharaoh with uh, the priests, and they, they turned the sticks to snakes. Yeah? So, so here we can see that is something very similar. The stick of Moses, Moses' stick, or Moses' cane, turned to be a real snake. So ate the other ropes and sticks. Yeah. So there, and only then, the priests realized that he is the messenger of God. And they followed him. Although they were threatened by the Pharaoh to be killed and to be uh, crucified and so on. But they said, no, this is the right way we are going with him. We're not talking about the Exodus because that's a big issue, a big session, but I just chose this because it is related to Shem and Nisim, and it tells us a little bit about the time of Moses uh, in Egypt and to show that it was sort of a tradition to meet on that day and to have the festival uh, uh, all over Egypt. Well, um, I just meant to give you an idea about the festivals we have in Egypt uh, today and how it's uh, related to ancient Egypt. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, my talk, my little talk today. And uh, if you have any question, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to take any of your questions and discuss it together. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Female do the dancing as well. Yes. Yes. That's, that's correct. That's why Shem Nisim doesn't come the same day every year. Yeah, It changes from a year to another because of Easter. So you take Easter and then you have a festival. Exactly. It's always the following Monday after Easter Sunday. No matter when is Easter, doesn't matter. Yeah. So uh, Easter uh, is almost one week different every, uh, every year, I think. Please. What's Sure. sure. The position of women in Egypt, uh, in crowds, or in church, or at home, is it the same? Yeah. Uh, men and women are uh, equal, exactly the same in Egypt. They have, they enjoy equal rights. Uh, maybe in Egypt you find that uh, women uh, are better treated than men, and they have maybe more rights than men. Because in, in the Eastern society, we look at uh, women as something precious. Women, according to the saying of Prophet Muhammad, they are the mothers, uh, the wives, the sisters, and the daughters, which means that they are more than half of the society. Another saying saying that someone came and asked him, uh, whom should I be good to? He said, your mother. And then, your mother. And then, your mother and then your father. So yeah, he mentioned the mother three times. So it's very important to treat women nicely. And he said that women are very uh, uh, fragile, very fragile, and you have to, to treat them nicely because you can easily break them. So this is the heart of religion Islam. But because we are in an Eastern society and uh, uh, the man is like responsible of the family and so on so the, 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 the woman gets lots of benefits because of that 
Now women are doing the same jobs as men. Uh, they are required to pay the same amount of tax. Uh, they, they, according to the law, they go both to education at the same age. Maybe they have more privileges because as men, when we finish our education, we have to do national service. We have to serve the army for a period between one and three years. Women don't do that, which I find it unfair because let's say I, I went to college with, with one of my female colleagues and we finished both at the same year and then I went to serve the army for three years while she's acting, uh, having a job. So by the time I finished serving the country, then she is been working for three years, making money and building career and so on. So it's very unfair. Yeah? If I'm serving the country somehow, so I should be rewarded in a way or another. Uh, when we talk about divorce, I'm just getting some bits and pieces to give you an example. Divorce in Egypt uh, or divorce in Islam. Who has the right to divorce the other one? Both of them. The woman has the right to divorce the man for no reason, even if she can come and say, I cannot stand this man anymore. No reason. More than this, I cannot just wake up next to this man every morning. Then she will be divorced. If they are divorced and they have children, so she keeps the children until the age of 18. Okay? And then they are given the choice either to go to the father or to stay with the mother. Age of 18, they are grown. Anyway. Yeah? And the father is responsible for their expenses and for her expenses as well until she gets married. If she doesn't get married, then it's his responsibility. Okay, she keeps the house or the apartment or whatever and keeps the children and gets the money as well. So the, uh, the, the husband have, has to think uh, uh, 10 times before thinking about divorce. So this is just an idea about uh, 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 voting, election, everything is exactly the same. Nancy, you had a question? Oh, it's kind of busy. Um, Amun Ray has uh, the uh, Ram head. What was the significance of making him a guy, a Ram head? That, that's a good question. The question is about Amun Ra and the Ram head. Uh, we have to understand that. Uh, We'll talk about this in particular when we talk about uh, religion in ancient Egypt, but as you are uh, asking now, um, in, in ancient Egypt they had great respect to all animals and birds and, and insects and so on. And they wanted, at the beginning of creation, they wanted to make their gods look different from humans. So they had the human body and they had different heads. Uh, the idea started when they had the totems and the, the, the masks of different animals, like in Africa when the, the priests were wearing different masks of, of animals or birds, whatever, and coming to the religious festivals. So the same thing was used in ancient Egypt, and it is like to make them different. So when you look at the figure, you know that he was not a human, and he was not an animal. Yeah. So he is something superior, something uh, uh, gathering both uh, uh, a human and animal in the same form. Uh, so in each part of Egypt was a famous animal. Like in Komombo was the crocodile, so you have the crocodile headed. In the Delta you have the cat, so the, the, the cat headed goddess busted. Um, in Dendera the cow, so you have the cow headed goddess Hathor and so on. So in this area was the ram, very famous in this area, so it was used as uh, the figure of Amun Ra. Right. So, I guess that, yeah, okay. please. Sorry, go ahead. Please. Uh, are yes. Are any uh, of the gods based on humans? Based on humans? Yeah, or were they all like, I mean, were they, like, um, Of course. At the very beginning of creation, they had the legend of Isis and Osiris, Set and Niftis. Those were four humans. And they were the sons and daughters of the gods. So they were the very first humans on earth. Yeah? Which is very similar to the story of Adam and Eve and their four children. It's funny when you go into the mythology and you find that it's <laughs> nothing is new. Yeah? So and one killed the other one. Yeah? So very much like Cain and Abel. So it's exactly the same thing. So these are humans. If you talk about 
something like this. Yes, they are humans. Yes. Coptic, yeah. To Arabic. So in this studies, I guess I'm just curious about how it is and what's the fight about how did how did that progress to get that Okay, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the language, the ancient Egyptian language started about 3000 BC and then it was developed generation after generation. It took about 1000 years to be well developed. So from 3000 BC until 2000 BC, it was okay. But 2000 BC, the language was very well developed and established. Yeah. And from that period of time, we have the most famous ancient Egyptian literature. Okay. Then 500 years later, Egypt was conquered. And the Egyptians were trying to keep their secrets. The conquerors didn't care about the language. So the Egyptians were safe because they kept their secrets. And this is how they can fight them back. Right. It was on and off like this. Uh, uh, independence and then uh, being conquered and so on, until the Greeks arrived. When the Greeks arrived, they were eager to learn the language, yeah? Because they wanted to learn about ancient Egypt and so on. So the Egyptians felt really worried about their, the traditional language and history and treasures and so on. So they were trying to confuse the Greeks by adding secret codes to the language. Because they put the codes so they know it. When they find in a text, they know, yeah? So ex uh, uh, exclude this one. It's, it's not a, a, a letter or something like that. The Greeks from their side was very difficult for them to pronounce many of the words. So they tried to make the words sound Greek by adding letters to the words as well. So we started with 26 letters, which is the original alphabet. By the time of the Greeks, like 200 or 100 BC, it was more than 2,000 letters. So it became very difficult and corrupt. Then the Greek language was introduced. It was used partly, especially among the elites. The Roman language was introduced. So it was used later on by the time of uh, the Roman occupation. And the, lang the, the, the ancient Egyptian language itself, after that corruption, moved to be, or changed to be, Coptic language. So the Coptic language was a very difficult language. But by the time they were using it, it was very, it was very difficult. And even like, like uh, Latin, uh, until very recently, uh, if you go to a church, they have the service in Latin, yeah, in Europe or he even here in the States. But people start to enjoy uh, their religion, enjoy going to the church, whatever, when they start having the service in English or in German or, or in French or whatever, yeah. The same thing happened in Egypt. The Copts, the, the, the early Christians, most of them maybe couldn't, couldn't follow the, 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 the rituals because it was in a very difficult language. So when Arabic was introduced, and it took like four centuries uh, uh, to, to, to be the main language, the Copts were very happy because they can, they can at least understand their, their, their religion. So it's not only the Muslims, but also... Uh, so, so gradually it happened. We're talking about like 5,000 years of development of the language. It's not overnight or over century. Yeah. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your coming and your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, if, if you would like to have more information in the future, uh, you can uh, check my website. Uh, you have my, my business card on the desk outside. And of course, you're most welcome to uh, check my website. Uh, when I get back home in like a, a week time from now, I'll be updating the website with lots of things. So, and uh, my email as well. So if you'd like to contact me at any time, ask about anything, of course, you're most welcome. Thank you.